Hey everybody! I know! Different setting, right? So we are trying out a new uh, filming method for the lecture video, so bear with me if the video looks a little weird. Um, that being said, like the background or the audio sounds a little bit weird. I'm just merely going through and testing things out to try a new system. So, well first of all, let's get that back to the beginning of the notes. So, again, technical <laughs> new system, please bear with me. So, today's going to be our first section of notes on the Industrial Revolution. We're going to cover sections 1 and 2 today, and then we'll cover sections 3 and 4 next time. So, go ahead and get your notes out and let's get started. So really when we're talking about the Industrial Revolution, we're starting in Great Britain and then we're talking about how it spread to everywhere else. And it was a gradual change. Because industrialization, compared to other revolutions we've talked about, was a very long and slow process. Especially as it was a change from farming to industry. And from simple handheld tools to more complex machines. And it's really why when we talk about the Industrial Revolution, we start our discussion in the realm of agriculture, actually. So just to kind of give you guys some background, life changed heavily, actually, as industry spread. The rural way of life was kind of going out of it, and people were moving from rural areas to more industrialized cities. So really here we start to see the rise of our major cities that we have today. Um, places like London, eventually Paris and France is another great example. And it's where a lot of people start to buy goods that someone else made instead of making them themselves. So we have some new machines to talk about. And the big thing, travel took a lot less time. The Industrial Revolution brought us our first locomotives. So for those of you that love trains, congratulations, we finally hit that point in history where we have trains. Um, the telegraph was also a huge thing as well that helped spread a lot of communication. Uh, anesthetics were being used uh, during surgery to prevent pain. The sewing machine was being invented here in the United States. And antiseptic methods or cleaning one's tools to practice medicine were being used more and more. So let's talk about agriculture a bit. So we have a couple main methods we need to talk about. The first one being a geographical one, that being dikes or earthen walls used to reclaim the land from the sea. And we have people like Charles Townsend who are bringing back those ideas of crop rotation that we talked about back when we did the Middle Ages. And then we have people like Jethro Tull who invented the seed drill, which you can see up in the top corner, uh, which helps deposit seeds in a row in a nice straight line instead of you going out there and literally just throwing the seeds in the field. And it was a lot less wasteful because that seed was getting placed directly in the ground. So... Enclosures also increased output, but it did cause migration. Now this was a process of taking over and consolidating the land formerly shared by peasant farmers. Uh, the output did increase under enclosure, there was a lot more competition, and those that were bought up and out of business moved to the cities to take jobs in the factories. It's why today we see more corporate or big company farms than we do smaller company farms today. So the population massively expanded during the Industrial Revolution, and there was a reduced risk of death from famine due to this massive change in agriculture. Now all those seeds were actually making it in the ground, there was a surplus of food, which helped improve the agriculture and people's health, because better nutrition led to better health. And by extension, those that moved to the cities experienced better hygiene, better sanitation, and better access to medical care than they had when they still lived in the countryside. So it's really here we start to talk about some changes to machinery. And one of the biggest things that changed that was coal, or a source of energy. Uh, this steam engine, which eventually would power machinery, locomotives, and steam shifts, was powered off of coal, which you would then light a blaze to heat a boiler to create steam. We have Thomas Newcomen, who actually first used a steam engine to pump water out of mines to help miners collect more minerals. And we have James Watt, who then went on to improve the design of the steam engine and apply it to other things. Uh, there's a couple examples of the steam engines that helped get the water out of the mines. 
we also have to talk about the use of iron. It's why in history we refer to the Industrial Revolution as the Iron Age. It's really when we start to see a lot more use of iron in construction, certain goods being produced, and a variety of tools. And Abraham Darby, using a process known as smelting, which you separate the iron from its ore to get pure iron, used it to help make building components. It was less expensive and of a better quality, allowing the construction of the first iron bridges, which you can see pictured down here, as well as that image there. So that's it for section one, but like I said, we are doing one and two today. So why did it start in Britain? Well, there was a major population growth, and they had a lot of natural resources, as well as access to a number of ports, rivers, uh, coal deposits, and iron. All the essential things one needed to get an industrial revolution off the ground. Now, to say that there was a demand for this was pretty high. These new tools were well sought after, and a lot of businesses seeked capital or money used to invest in enterprises. These enterprises were business organizations in an area such as shipbuilding, mining, railroads, or factories. Think of uh, what we refer to today like the automotive industry. We refer to that would also be an enterprise. It's a business organization in the area of producing cars. So really here we also have the rise of entrepreneurs who manage and assume the financial risk of starting said new business. Really is here where we start to see the guilds that we talked about during the Renaissance and the Middle Ages start to be phased out of society. And the capital was then invested in the factories and employed the workforce. Another major thing that helped uh, get the Industrial Revolution off the ground was a stable government in Britain. So really, we need to talk about the textile industry. Now, textiles, would, or a type of cloth or woven fabric, was the largest industry. And the putting out system, or the cottage industry, saw raw cotton being transformed by peasant families who had then spun it into thread and wove that thread into cloth, and then skilled artisans finished and dyed the cloth. This was the putting out system. The textile industry would then change that to automate it a lot more. So we have things such as the flying shuttle, invented by John Kay, which increased that speed of weaving and it made things go a lot faster. And we have James Hargreaves and his invention, the spinning jenny, right here. A machine for spinning with more than one spindle at a time, meaning you can make fabric at a much faster rate. Now, we also have Richard Arkwright, who invented the water frame, this device right here, a spinning machine powered by water. Now, as much as we like to talk about in, uh, advancements during the Industrial Revolution being uh, powered by coal, there were just as many being powered by water as well. Hydroelectricity was very popular during the Industrial Revolution prior to the discovery and harnessing of electricity for factories. And then here in the United States, we have Eli Whitney, who invented the cotton gin, this device right here which helped separate the seeds from raw cotton, which was a very long process if you one had to do it by hand. So factories were born in Britain. These new machines were too large for homes and they ended the putting out system that we talked about a few minutes ago. They built various sheds and buildings all over the place. You had to have workers to operate the machines and for the most part, they all were near water. Factories, at least the early ones, were all built along rivers to harness the power of the river to power the factory. And they used that water power or hydroelectricity for as long as they could until they could get access to steam engines. So we also have to talk about the transportation revolution. We have turnpikes or private roads built by entrepreneurs who charge travelers a toll or fee to use them. We do have a few of those here in the United States. Um, but turnpikes are more popular uh, in Europe, especially in England, and I believe Germany has a few as well. We have the extensive use of canals, or efficient, inexpensive ways to receive coal and raw materials, and the steam locomotive that was not bound to water, and you could ship things over land. Previously, before the steam engine became popularized, you had to transport everything on the river. Not every place is accessible by the water, which made it difficult. And in England, the first major railroad line was from Liverpool to Manchester, increasing the spread of goods and coal from one end of the country to the other. And that's it for notes for today. So your assignment 
is going to be to do the Industrial Revolution reflection that is on Google Classroom. It's another reflection assignment over what we went over today. Please remember, do not simply just copy and paste from the notes. I will know. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email or talk to me in class. I will see you all next time. Hopefully this video sounds good. Bye, everyone.